There we go. Okay. So we are live here. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go ahead and while people are coming in and taking their seats, um, first of all, hello out there. If you're here for our event with Frank Mortimer and Bob Tannum for Frank's book, be people right behind me, you are in the right place. Um, I'm Carr, I'm the events coordinator here for Green Apple Books in San Francisco. And before we get started this evening, I'm gonna tell you about a couple of events we have coming up while you're getting cozy and taking your seats in your homes, joining us from wherever you are. And if you're joining us from anywhere, anywhere in particular or unusual, feel free to write in the chat where you're joining us from, we'd love to know. Uh, so on, on our the Green Apple Books event calendar on Monday, this coming Monday, April 19th at 6 p.m. Pacific time, you can join us on Instagram Live when we're joined by author and attorney Jenny Romer. She's going to be joining us to discuss her book, Can I Recycle This?, which is an incredible guide that gives you the what and how of recycling. Jenny's a sustainability expert and a legal associate for the Surfrider Foundation's Plastic Pollution Initiative. She knows a lot about single-use plastics and how to reduce them in your life. Uh, so we'll be talking about that and she'll be answering your questions. You can join us then. That's Monday, April 19th at 6 p.m. Pacific time. And then next Saturday, April 24th, all day is Independent Bookstore Day. It's our biggest day of the year. And we'll have in-store shopping exclusive raffles, book giveaways. And we're very excited to also be partnering with Oakland-based nonprofit Creative Growth for a poetry reading from some of their artists. Creative Growth is an art space supporting adult artists with disabilities by providing them studio space, gallery space, representation, and we're really excited to be working with them. So all of that is next Saturday, April 24th, uh, all day. Uh, we have more information about that on our website and a full event calendar at greenapplebooks.com. All of our events are free unless stated otherwise. That being said, if you can, please do buy books. Please do buy them from us if you can. I have one book in particular that you might be interested in buying right behind me. Uh, and if you've been here before, you've heard me say that when you buy books from us, it supports us as a store in putting on events like these. It supports the authors who have put so much time and energy into writing these books, and then you get a book out of it. So do consider buying a book from us if you can. And if you buy Frank Mortimer's book from us, it comes with a little seed packet of bee friendly uh, plants that you can put in your garden. So get them while you can. Be the first on your block. <laughs> um, we still have um, some for you to pick up either in store or online. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce the folks that are joining us this evening. First, we have Bob Tannum here. Bob is a retired retail nurseryman, and up until 1998, he owned and operated Tannum's Garden Centers in Belvedere and San Rafael. Since retirement, Bob has volunteered to supervise an organic vegetable garden at New Beginnings in Novato, a program to feed and house the homeless while training them for employment. The production of the garden has exceeded the needs of the organization, with the excess being turned over to the Marin County Food Bank, who is a friend of Green Apple as well. We're always happy to support them. He's an active member of the Garden Writers of America and was the chair for the symposium in 1993 here in San Francisco. His radio show, Bob Tannum in the Garden, has been on KSFO since 1995. His garden show has won the Garden Writers Association Award of Excellence nationwide for on-air talent. He has been honored with this award two times in the past several years. His radio show is one of the most listened to Sunday program, programs on KSFO, and he was elected fellow by the Garden Writers in 2011. Thank you for joining us. Please welcome Bob Tannum. And then last but certainly not least, Frank Mortimer is an adjunct instructor at the Cornell University Master Beekeeping Program, Vice President of the New Jersey State Beekeepers Association, and a certified master beekeeper. As president of the Northeast New Jersey Beekeepers Association, a position he's held for over a decade, he significantly grew his club's membership. 
aligned, aligned the Northeast New Jersey beekeepers with Ramapo College and founded the Honey Cup, an annual honey tasting competition. Frank has promoted beekeeping throughout the Northeast by speaking to everyone from school children to gardening clubs to civic organizations. He's led beekeeping seminars across the Northeast and at the New York Botanical Garden. In addition, he successfully campaigned for his hometown of Ridgewood to become New Jersey's first Bee City USA. Bee City USA. Great. Go, go. <laughs> Frank has written multiple articles featured in the widely circulated Bee Culture magazine, and his book, Bee People and the Bugs They Love, is the reason we are here this evening. Please join me in welcoming Frank Mortimer. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Hi there, Frank. Hi, Bob. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Well, I'm delighted you're here. I'm delighted to be on. I'm glad that everything worked out. So I, you know, I'm a, I'm not a uh, excellent person to talk to on things that I don't understand, including anything. But if it's plants or bugs, I can understand that. <laughs> and bees. And uh, I love it. Yeah, bees and plants. It's like I'm always amazed at what you know from an evolutionary standpoint how they evolve together you know and um that you know if you look you want the answer to one you look at the other to figure out what's happening it's a it's an amazing kind of thing and i've always been very sensitive to bees uh and uh, i have people in my family that are allergic to bees and one of the things that i told them when you're around a bee don't be afraid because that exactly is what they're whenever you do that why you're in trouble <laughs> Yeah, I start my bee talks. I have a picture of a bee on my finger, and it's and what I what I always say is that um, if you leave the bees alone and they're nice to them, they're going to be nice to you. Uh, yeah. because they're just they're just motivated on doing their job, which is gathering food and um, water for their their hives, so they can continue to grow. And I love it because uh, I, I many times I've run across wild bee hives. Uh, in backpacking and things like that. And uh, one day, one of the my people that were with me <laughs> opened up a whole big case of it on a, on a rotten log. And I said, don't move, just mm -hmm. don't move. And boy, is that the hardest thing not to do is to not move because if you run, you're through. <laughs> well, that's why I, I refer to beekeeping as forced Zen because you have to be present in the moment and it, and it makes you slow down to pay attention to what you're doing. And then you can really absorb the bees through all your senses. Um, you know, it's, it's, of course, it's visual, but it's also, you know, listening to them and smelling the honey and all the other stuff in the hive. And then, and then also you're touching, you know, because as you're in there, you, you know, because bees, their entire bodies are covered with hair. Even their eyes have hair on it. And oh. so when you're moving your fingers, you actually can touch the bees as you go. Do you have in your book uh, things that uh, would attract bees to your garden that might possibly have a, a, an effect on how important the bees are? I, I touch at different points of some of the plants that they go to. Um, and what's interesting, though, is that so it takes 12 bees lifetime work to make a teaspoon of honey. And yeah. so that means it takes about 1200 bees to make a pound of honey. And to make that pound of honey takes 2 million flowers. And to, to get to those 2 million flowers means that the, they collectively flew about 56,000 miles, which is twice around the Earth's equator. So when you think about that many flowers that are in bloom, and I'm in the suburbs, right? So it's right. like, well, what plant would you know, be able to sustain and have that many flowers? And it's mostly trees. So, because um, if you look around, you know, I'm, I think anywhere in the US and suburbs, that's the plant that would exist the most and have that many blooms. I uh, found out a little factoid the other day. Well, it's been a couple of years ago. I, I have a good memory uh, that it, the beehives that are put into the almond orchards in California, the honey isn't really as acceptable as it is uh, to a lot of other plants and trees that they pollinate. I never heard of that before. Did you? That the, that, that the honey isn't, or you mean that the pollen? No, the honey isn't any, uh, it's, it's not really sweet or something wrong with it. In other words, it's not recommended as a honey plant, uh, a honey, um, what do I want to say? Uh, a product that you can actually use if you're interested in a sweet honey. I didn't know that. Did you? No, probably not. 
<laughs> these <laughs> things get into my head and they don't go anywhere. They just stay in a big cesspool in the back of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting with the almond pollination, though, it's the largest pollination event in the world because yeah. 80% of the world's almonds come from that one area in Northern California. And the New York Times said it was a $7.6 billion industry that is 100% dependent upon honeybees. And two out of every three hive in America goes there every February to do the pollination. I mean, it's an oh, yeah. amazing event. Yeah, isn't that great? Now, that is something in my, the back of my mind that just popped out, so I'm really not familiar. So uh, it's, I guess it's okay to be there. I never knew that. Tell me more about your book. Um, so, so my book, it, it's focused on the suburban beekeeping and it's, it's like my journey from how I got into beekeeping because I was never, I never knew any beekeepers. I was never around bees, but it's something that I always wanted to do. So it's how I got involved in it. And then just um, many of the mistakes that I made along the way and all the uh, interesting and eccentric characters that I've met in beekeeping. <laughs> Oh, I'll bet. Uh, what else uh, in the book to, have you uh, sort of concentrated on, like the production of them or what are other things do, do you like about Do you like these? Of course you do. Yeah. <laughs> well, you I have I, to I, love them. Yeah, I, I definitely, it, it's my passion. And um, I, I got into bees just because I wanted to be around them. And then, um, and I kind of talked about this in my book, like I didn't get into it for the honey production, but honey is a measure of success because the healthier your bees are, the more honey they can make. So I have, now I'm excited about how much honey I can, I can get from my bees. But um, it's just like, my wife always says that when I go out to the hives and I come back, she can tell because I'm just so much more centered and happy and just relaxed. <laughs> so you like them, huh? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Well, you'd have to love them to write a book about them. Uh, you have a, a, a packet of flower seeds or something like that that attracts bees. I, I wasn't quite sure what that meant. That, um, that uh, the, my publisher has, is, has given a Green Apple Books uh, seed packets that so anybody who buys the book from Green Apple will get a, a bee-friendly packet of seeds. Oh, okay. So that sounds good. Is there any other trick to attracting bees to your uh, location? If you have limited, well, you're in a cosmopolitan area, so I'm assuming that you would have uh, sort of a like, uh, how do I attract bees to my, let's say, deck or patio? So the, the best thing to do for attracting bees is to plant in big clusters, because back to the, um, that they need 2 million flowers for a pound. And so that as, you know, bees, they they work in a system to maximize their effort. So if you have a cluster of flowers together, then they're, they're more likely to attract bees because the way their bees communicate in two different ways. They communicate with smells, pheromones, sure. um, and actually uh, bees don't have noses. They have antenna. That's how they smell. And then the other way is with the waggle dance. And um, the, so they, in the hive, which is pitch black, they do this dance which can give directions to a food source that, and bees can travel over five miles from their hive. And that, that dance will be accurate within one meter. And on the planet, there's only two creatures that can give directions to food sources, bees and people. <laughs> okay, I'll take that. Uh, one of the other thoughts that I had uh, about you and yourself and your beehives, do you actually produce bee uh, honey for people or for sale and stuff like that? Yes. Yeah. I, um, I you're do. a businessman. Well, I, it's beekeeping is, is my hobby um, or addiction, however you want to look at it. Uh, but yeah, we, we be in my family because beekeeping is how my family, like that's what we do together. So I say some people might go out back and shoot hoops or whatever, but we bottle honey and make lip balm, but uh, we've been averaging you know, so the bees first have to have honey for themselves. So in the East Coast, you have to leave about 80 pounds of honey on the hive for the bees. So right. after doing that, I'm averaging about 130 pounds per hive for me. So like okay. last year, I got over 1800 pounds. So yeah, okay. so I do sell my honey. Uh, it's an interesting thought that uh, 
pops into my mind. Of course, there's a lot of popping like popcorn goes on all the time in my mind. Uh, when uh, you want to have a beehive in your yard uh, and you live in fairly close to uh, your neighbors, is there any secret to quell the, the problems that your neighbor might have? Oh my God, he's got bees. So that um, what we say in New Jersey is that you have to, you have to be a good neighbor first and foremost. And um, because if you have a bad relationship with a neighbor, then if you get bees, it's like pouring gas on the fire. But that bees, what they do is when they leave a hive that within 15 feet, they go up to 30 feet. So their cruising altitude is above a, uh, an area that would affect people. So if, if one of the tricks you can do is you can put a flight barrier, so either a fence or, or bushes that are six feet high. So as the bees come out, it forces them to go up faster. Um, but you know, keeping bees is legal in New York City as it is in uh, San Francisco. Sure. And, those are, and so in urban settings, you can have bees and not be a problem with people. So it's really not a problem in any size yard that you have. One of the things I've noticed over the many years, I have a big bush of uh, bottle brush, which at one time was nothing but a big beehive. Uh, that the bee population seems to be declining. Is there anything that, a, let's say, a person like myself or any gardener can do to help attract some bees to their location, maybe uh, increase the amount of things or maybe even put in a beehive. So I, I if, if there's a few things in your in your question there. Yes, yeah, so the, the bee population has been declining. Um, and, and the main cause of that is there's a parasitic mite called Varroa destructor. Yeah, let's talk about that. And so the, um, the Varroa is not a native parasite to the, to the honeybee and it um, came to the U.S. in 1987. And the varroa mite <clears throat> is everywhere that there's honeybees around the globe, except for Australia and Newfoundland. And the, the, the mites, in addition, so first what they do is they feed on the larvae, so the developing baby bees. And then additionally, the mites are a vector for bee viruses. And these are viruses that only affect honeybees. But if you think about where we're living how we're living now with a pandemic, bees can't socially distance. So these mites <clears throat> are spreading more and more viruses that are killing off the bees. And yeah. so as beekeepers, we have to treat for the mites more often. Now, how do you do that? Or uh, is it an organic method or is it somewhat of a chemical method? <clears throat> there's both. So there's um, the chemical method, which is the most effective is yeah. it's a product called Apivar and it uses a chemical called Amitraz that's made from a pharmaceutical company in France. And France is much more strict than the US when it comes to natural stuff. And so that they use it in France. So I think you know, like, that's my way of saying, I think it's okay. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> okay. And then the, um, the, the more natural way is um, you can use oxalic acid and oxalic acid is what naturally occurs. It, it comes in spinach and rhubarb and other plants. I understand that. And if anybody has under the kitchen sink Barkeeper's friend, that's that's oxalic acid. Okay, so uh, it's somewhat uh, under control, but not. How do you know you, when you have that pro, uh, that problem? Uh, is there any sign that you can uh, check out? Yeah, so it's it's not if it's how many mites you have, and so um, you have to check regularly of how many mites per hundred bees that you have. Mm -hmm. And um, if it gets above a threshold, then that's when you treat. Um, but then with the viruses that the mites spread, you can see it like there's one, the most prevalent that you can, or the easiest to see is deformed wing virus. And uh -huh. the bees' wings look like they're been burnt or shrunk up. Um, wow. So it's, and then that like, you know, then there's also different um, paralysis uh, diseases. There's about three or four of them. So the bees will actually like shake, kind of like a wet dog. On, when you see them on the cone. Yeah, okay. Does it attract the, uh, does it affect the drones as much as the females? Um, or the, the queen? It, 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 the ones I'm referring to mostly affect the worker bees. Now mm -hmm. with, um, but the thing is that the drones are the male bees. Well, the, I understand that. Maybe nobody else does, but I do. Yeah. <laughs> 
So, Been there, done that. <laughs> so the, the drones take longer to hatch out. And so because of that, that uh, the mites are more attracted to them because then um, when they, the, the drone finally emerges, that there is actually more mites that will emerge with it than it would on a worker. Uh, oh, okay, oh, that's wonderful. Very good knowledge and stuff like that. Um, I've, been, I've done an awful lot, well, being a nurseryman for several hundred years, a, a long time, uh, I'm very attracted to the pollination part of that type of thing, including the mites. And uh, is there any natural, natural predator for that mite that might uh, sort of correct the situation or are we working on anything like that? There, there's no natural uh, predator for it because the mite for, for eons lived on the Asian bee and then it jumped over to the to oh, what, honeybee. European, European honeybee bee. in the 60s. So that's why, you know, like on the Asian bee, it was able, they were able to have a host parasite relationship oh, where okay. they were able to control each other. Sure. And, and but that the, the European honeybee doesn't have that same ability. Not um, right at this time anyway. Okay. Uh, that's wonderful. I just uh, filling in some blank spots on my, uh, my brain as far as my knowledge of bees. There are a lot of bee clubs uh, in the United States and there are a lot of organizations that, uh, uh, all of a sudden, my experience with them, of course, has been with uh, county fairs and that type of thing, where the uh, local organizations of bees. Uh, in your book, do you publish any way they can uh, do things like that? Or is there bee, uh, what do I want to say, Be high? No, <laughs> be, care, be careful, be, uh, you know, <laughs> all that kind of good stuff. Maybe uh, uh, like in how, how they can contact a local bee uh, uh, organization that would be very helpful to a lot of people. Yeah, that's when, when anybody asks me how what's the what's the first thing they should do if somebody's interested in keeping bees. I always say find your local bee club. And um, actually, I have uh, the appendix at the end of my book lists different uh, ways that you can find that. But every state in all fifty states has has bee clubs. Sure. Um, and then there's also more regional ones as well. Usually all, they all participate in local uh, county fairs. So in California, we have a plethora of county fairs. And uh, so I've, that's been my knowledge since I used to uh, uh, advertise through displays of gardens in uh, county fairs and things like that. That's why I'm so familiar with that particular part of it. But that's great. What about, tell me a little more about the book. How did you come to write it? <laughs> it's, uh, um, it, there, I kept, like I, when I would just, when beekeepers get together, we kind of share different funny stories of things that happen. And, you know, we, everyone starts laughing. It's like, oh, you know, somebody should write a book about all these stories. So that's more what my book is because it's, it's, it's not a how-to book. Um, there's lots of great how-to books out there. So this is a, a book that's more about beekeepers than it is about bees. And it just weaves in the facts oh, about fun. bees yeah. into it. So tell me a story. <laughs> 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 um it's uh well would you, would you like me to read uh what sure. little, yeah. read from the book i'm gonna you wrote um, it so i'm on, i think you can read it <laughs> okay so i and also too like you know there's the uh, um the old saying that you can learn from your mistakes so i've made some colossal mistakes so that's why i'm hoping that my mistakes will not only teach me but can teach a whole <laughs> <laughs> that's a great idea yeah so uh, i'm going to read about one of my mistakes um most of my monumental mistakes usually began with me saying, let me just do this real fast. Whenever I think I'll move at a faster speed or that I'll get something done zippity quick is when the bees remind me it's always a better idea for me to take my time and never ever rush. The first time my soon to be wife experienced her first bee sting was when I said, I need to feed one of my hives some more sugar syrup. I'll be quick, let me just do this real fast. Then, because I was focused on working fast instead of watching what I was doing, I made a series of mistakes that led to my surprise that she still married me, soon to be wife getting stung on her right thigh. <laughs> Since I was going to be moving fast, I thought I'd skip lighting the smoker, which led to alarm pheromones getting released and putting the bees on high alert. Next, I haphazardly laid the inner cover, which was covered in a fair number of bees against the side of the hive, and when I went to pour the syrup into the hive top feeder, I bumped into the inner cover, causing it to topple over and land on my never screamed, 
but couldn't believe what I had done. Surprised that she still married me, soon to be wife's feet. Once the inner cover hit the ground, the bees became airborne, and the one that landed on my bride's thigh decided that she had had enough. Thankfully, once my so much smarter than me, never screamed, but couldn't believe what I had done, surprised that she still married me, soon to be wife realized that she had gotten stung. She immediately walked away from the hives, went back to the car and waited until I was done. Now, whenever she accompanies me to the hives, the first thing she says is, did you light your smoker? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I would guess that. Uh, what about winter feed? I, you know, that's something I've just become aware of that during the winter time when the flowers aren't blooming or there's not really much honey around, you have to feed them during the winter time. Is there something, some formula, magic or otherwise that you give them that? Yeah, and it's, what's interesting is that um, the whole reason that honeybees make honey is so that their sisters who aren't even existing yet will have food to eat through the winters because mm -hmm. worker bees only live for about six weeks. So you yeah. have this limited time that they're able to collect honey, um, you know, collect nectar to make honey. And then they're just storing it away for use by, like I said, you know, creatures that don't exist yet. And so the, the once, you know, like, so in New Jersey, we, our bloom season is only from April to July. So they have right. about 120, 150 days to make all this honey. Um, and then, so what happens and especially now with the, uh, climate change and you have these highs and lows in the winter so whenever it gets hot then the bees are consuming their honey so what if it was a normal season that their metabolism would slow down and they would have enough but because now the highs and lows they consume it faster so what okay. we do in the winter is we pop open the cover and if we see the bees at the top we know they ran out of food because bees always start at the bottom and this is in nature too and then they slowly move up and consume the honey so if you're at the top and they're already consuming it, then that's when you know you have to feed them. And so what we do is we feed them uh, just solid candy. So we take just sugar, water, cook it into um, into a slurry, let it cool. And then and then it's like these big, I mean, it, we could eat it because it's five pounds at a time of sugar. <laughs> sure, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, in California, we, uh, I don't know, they still feed them in the wintertime because the blossom cycle isn't that uh, extensive during the winter time other than maybe that's the popularity of the uh, New Zealand material that we have growing in our gardens like the bottle brush or the uh, what's the other one that uh, the uh, Australian tea tree which is not a tea tree at all but then that's what the name was but anyway that's another thought that it's a fa fascinating thing that's great. Uh, I wonder if anybody wants to buzz in and ask a question or anything like that. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll see. Green apple. There you go. Hi. Hi. I thought you were hiding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just uh, doing the running the tech back here. Um, okay. But yeah, we do have a couple of questions actually from the audience. We have um, one. One here is from Carol, who says, Frank, I wish you could have called the tasting prize the Stanley Cup, too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I loved your book. Can you speak to the likelihood of the EPA banning um, neonicotinoids? You're, you'll excuse me if I'm uh, pronouncing it incorrectly. And Tracy had a similar question about um, state policies about uh, pesticide use and pollinators. Um, as mm -hmm. well. And Carol says uh, it's illegal in Europe, as you probably know. Yeah, it's uh, um, with, the, with the neonics is I, I think that we're going to see more at the state level um, about restricting it. Like I know, uh, you know, obviously I'm mostly familiar with New Jersey because that's my state. But then there's currently a bill right now in front that's trying in front of the legislators here to try to limit it. So I don't know if the EPA will ever do it because, you know, we got, always got to put the dollars first. But my guess is that at the state level, we, we would be able to do some more uh, restrictions on it and then hopefully lead to a full out ban. Yeah, go ahead. They have a cycle in California that they <clears throat> refuse to let uh, chemicals be used in certain areas, uh, hopefully to protect the bees. And I think it's very successful in many areas. So I think that's a good plus. Yeah, and it's, um, I mean, and, and so what the tar, what neonics are, it's, it's a form of 
pesticide that's based on nicotine. So like what always blows me away, you know, it's, it's, they'll tell you it's bad to smoke, but it's okay to put on your food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I used to do it a lot, but I don't do that anymore. <laughs> like, in, yeah, never mind. <laughs> I thought smoking calmed bees. I'm just joking. <laughs> yeah. That's a good, so, because bees do communicate through smells. And so there, what there's what every, there's different jobs in a hive. And one of the jobs that the worker bees have is guard bees. And so they literally like bouncers at a club will hang out on the front entrance and if a predator or anything's coming up, they'll release an alarm pheromone, which, by the way, smells like bananas. Um, <laughs> so that will alert the hive to go on alert. So like the analogy I use with kids is that when they are in school and they hear a fire alarm go off, they know to go outside. So the smoke blocks it. So even though the fire alarm is sounding, that they can't detect it. So they're like, hey, everything's fine. There's a giant that just took the roof of our house off, but it's okay, there's no alarm. <laughs> That's um, a great, great story. <laughs> there's a lot of, because there are so many parallels between um, bees and humans, and it's very, it's very literary to compare um, humans to, to bees. It's a, a long tradition in, in literary history. Um, is there any way that humans are maybe um, more like bees or what's like maybe the greatest comparison or is there anything that humans can learn from bees about how to be? So I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to the, go after the last thing you said first. And, then, and I think that that's one of the attractions of why people are so into honeybees. Like, it's interesting, you know, they found cave paintings that were like 35,000 years old of people, you know, get, collecting honey in the, you know, in these cave drawings. The ancient Egyptians actually had hives made out of logs. So we've been doing this for a while. And I think that, you know, like there's a lot of symbolism to look at the bees to think that they, they're eurosocial, so they you know that the whole organism is more important than the individual. And if you think about it, that you know these these worker bees work their life to create this tiny bit of honey, so their sisters who don't exist yet have food. I mean, that how how awesome is that? If we as a society could think of the entire group of us and do what's best for the group as opposed to just, just, just ourselves. I mean, that, that alone, I think, is a great lesson. Yeah, I like the idea that they have a little war dance when, let's say, one of the searching bees goes out and finds a bonanza of honey. Uh, he comes back to the hive, or she does, and uh, does a little dance and things like that. Somehow or other, that's communicated to the hive, and off they go to get the honey. That's an amazing situation. Yeah. And like I said, it's only people and bees that can give directions to food. But then Tara, like to your question about like comparing bees to, to humans. So uh, I have this whole thing that like, if you look at, at bees that at one time they were solitary and then honeybees and then they, they evolved into this organization, this, this Euro, this community. And if you look at us as humans, when we were more agricultural, we were more on our own and now we're moving into more urban settings. And so it, it, it does seem in some ways that you can draw parallels to as to the urbanization of humans moving towards like a more beehive sort of state. Okay, I'll take that. <laughs> and that's my crazy <laughs> thought. That's just me. <laughs> okay, that's good. Uh, <clears throat> that's an interesting kind of thing. Uh, are there other forms of pollinators around that might mimic bees? Is that something that you might consider or look at? Yeah, so there's there there's a lot of native pollinators that um, as a beekeeper, because we're stewards of all pollinators that we have to, like that's another reason to treat for mites because some of these viruses that they yeah. carry can impact native pollinators too. So yeah, it's the responsibility of the beekeeper to keep everything healthy. But my favorite imitator is the hoverfly, which on a glance, it really looks like a bee. Like it's, it's striped the same. And like I said, like you really, the way I had the first time I encountered it, the only way I was able to tell it wasn't a bee is I caught one and I, and I, and it would actually was imitating like it was going to sting me with its tail and it uh -huh. didn't, but it took that for me to go, this isn't a honeybee. So, <laughs> and that's what the hover bee does is that by 
by looking like a bee, a lot of other things will leave it alone, but it's a fly. And then as you look closer, you can see it has two wings and not four. It has the fly eyes and its antenna looks different too. Amazing. <laughs> and, and, and that's like the thing. Now, it, how many people would say, I'm going to see if this thing will sting me. And that's how I'll tell if it's a bee. You know, and that, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Although uh, bumblebees are a little different uh, and uh, there are all sorts of different kinds of bees. But honeybees is probably the most uh, sought after because it uh, really helps agriculture. And after all, we need the bees to do the pollination and that type of thing. But they never go after a tomato plant. Did you know that? It's well, um, what's interesting is that if you if you think about the different crops that honeybees are pollinating, those are not native as well. So like, you know, think about California, oranges are not native to North America, right? Which, which to me is such a fascinating thought. Like if you, if you think about that, what this, what North America would look like before there was apples and oranges and, you know, almonds and all that, it must've been a completely different place. Yeah. It's an amazing thing. Uh, of course, pollen and <clears throat> tomatoes are, one of the major crops that most people grow. And that's not the thing they, but however, when they grow zucchini, they need the bees. Yeah. That's gotta and happen. All the squash and pumpkins as well, yep. Yep, the whole big series of stuff. Yeah, it's an amazing kind of thing. So it's an interesting story about uh, bees and honeys and male, female uh, queens and that type of thing. Uh, there are a lot of cartoons out about bees and females and males. So I, I wasn't too sure about uh, one thing was that I didn't know the, the, the anatomy of the female bee. I, I had no, you know, they're neutered. Uh, it's only the queen that can actually multiply and lay eggs and things like that, which she does with a vengeance. Uh, it's a pretty good thing, but she hasn't much else to do in her life except eat and produce. Correct. Yeah. Another name for the queen bee could be you know, mother bee or egg layer. And at its peak, a, the queen can lay up to 2000 eggs a day. <laughs> and the reason is, is because a worker bee's life expectancy is six weeks. So yeah. the queen has to produce that many to get the, the, the hive up to 60,000 bees at its peak. And like, what's interesting about like, so, you know, like so many other uh, insects, only the queen survives the winter and goes into a hibernation but honeybees maintain a large population. And the reason that is, is that, so once the first things start blooming, that the bees have a workforce to go start collecting that nectar right away. So mm -hmm. they're one of the first out because of, of, of how they've evolved. What about swarming? What causes that? So um, if you think about uh, high school biology, when we learned about single cell organisms, single cell organisms uh, reproduce by dividing in two. So what swarming is, is exactly that. If you think of the, the hive as the single organism, that when it's healthy and strong, it will, the, the worker bees will create a new queen. And then it's the old queen and half the bees will leave. And so that the new queen and the remaining half can stay in the more secure space. And then the ones that left will find a new place to live. And so when they first leave, they just bivouac on something. So that's when you, it makes the news a lot of times when there's a big ball of bees hanging from a stop sign or a bicycle or something, but they're just hanging there until the scalp bees can find a new place to live. And um, Tom Seeley, uh, one of the most well-known bee researchers, out of, and he's out of Cornell, um, he has a book, Honey Bee Democracy, where he talks about, he studied the, the dances that the bees do to give directions and how they come to consensus of where to go. And it's, it's basically, there could be 12,000 bees, but if you get to like 12 to 15 scouts, all saying the same location would be a good place to live. Once they hit that number, the colony goes and that's where they're gonna live. I'll be darned. I, uh, I didn't know the reason. So it's just an overpopulation kind of thing. It's a, it's a reproduction, not an over, it's a reproduction. Oh, okay. Because only a healthy hive will swarm. And okay. what's interesting is that like back um, 
you know, when our society was more agrarian, that that beekeepers would encourage swarming because it meant more bees. But sure. now that we're so uh, built out that beekeepers try to reduce the swarming tendency. So like that's a big part of what we're doing uh, right now in the spring and early summer is, you know, doing, I'll call it tricks to try to keep the bees from feeling that they need to do that. Yeah, when they transport, let's say a lot of bee growers transport their hives to, uh, let's say the almond orchards in California, how do they keep the bees in that hive? Uh, is there some secret or is it, do the bees just go dormant or something? So the, the main secret is, is that, that wherever the queen is, the colony will follow. So as long as the queen is in the hive, the bees will go there. But then when they're shipping the, 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 the bees on the trucks, they have a net over it. So sometimes bees will come out of the hive, but they're still contained in that general area. Okay. All right. Because I was curious about the transportation of that, because that can be sort of a bewildering uh, idea. <laughs> okay, shut up, Tanum. <laughs> yeah. We have All a right. couple more questions here sure. from the audience. Um, so uh, someone here says the waggle dance is pretty impressive, even more so if they do it in the pitch dark. Can you talk more about the waggle dance, please? Sure. So what's, um, and it's really cool to watch. And if you Google it and, and, and you know, you can find it on YouTube and I have like some on my YouTube channel, Frank the Bee Man. But what it, what's cool is that um, the bees, when they're giving directions, they're, they assume that the sun is at 12 o'clock. And then, so as they're on the comb, so like, let's pretend, um, and I love to do this live, by the way, because I'll, I'll point at something and say, okay, what's that over there? So like for you, think about where the Golden Gate Bridge is, right? So let's pretend it's at a, um, it's at, if, if the sun's at noon, if I flew at uh, four o'clock at that angle, that that's, I would fly right into the Golden Gate Bridge. So what the bees will do on the comb is, and we'll say, uh, you know, four o'clock. So in that direction. So every time they're on the comb, if, if they're, if the location is more than a football field away, they'll go in a figure eight. And every time that they're at four o'clock at that angle, then they shake their body. And I don't know if you can see my hand, but they'll like literally waggle their body. And it's like a big neon sign. that's like fly in that direction. And then if it's like the, you know, a giant thing of, of flowers or nectar, then they'll be really excited as they do it. So the, the, the more that they shake, the bigger the food source and the longer they shake correlates directly on how far away the food source is. Mm. And then all the other movements that they're doing that we speculate that, that they're giving direction. So like, I always say like, imagine in our car, as opposed to saying, you know, go down to Maple and hang a right. And then when you get to Glen, hang a left that if we it gave directions by imitating what we would be doing with the steering wheel, the, 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 you know, the turn signal and the brake and the gas. And that's what they think the bees are doing with the rest of the movements. Amazing, totally. And then cool. what's kind of cool too, like to really nerd out. And that's the thing about <laughs> that I like is there's this whole practical side to it, but then there's this whole nerd side to it. And I'm a self-described bee nerd. And that's why in my book, I have these things called bee nerd alerts where it goes deeper into the content. Um, but that what, so let's say that you have multiple sources of food. So you have these multiple dances, then they almost have a dance off to try to convince the people that they have the better, the, the, convince the bees that they have a better food source and that's where they should go. And since it's a limited amount of, of resources, i.e. number of bees of where they, how they can deploy them, then the, actually that was studied by Tom Seeley and a computer scientist and what they did is they created an algorithm that now web servers use of how to divert web traffic around in the most efficient way, based on honeybees. That's and so wild. Other, I know. They don't have a compass. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the, so bees don't need a compass. That, that, so they have five eyes. They have the two that you see, then they have three up here yeah. above their head, and they can see the polarity of the sun. So kind of like... <laughs> To be silly, kind of like how the Vikings were able to travel without uh, a compass or seeing the sun because they could, they could yeah. see the polarity of it. Bees are the same way, so they're always able to, to um, fly based on that, and then they can adjust as the sun moves through the sky. Amazing, just totally, yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness. 
And some other cool things about bees is um, that they've shown that they can count to the number four. And they're one of the few creatures that understands the concept of zero. <laughs> hey, I know some high school kids that don't even have that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's incredible. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, bees are already amazing and super uh, creatures because of all that they do and how we benefit from that. But oh my goodness, they're like, I'd say superhuman, but they're not human. Um, <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, a, a couple of other audio audience questions that we have here. Um, one is how did the members of your bee club or other various bee people that may or may not appear in the book uh, react to your book? <laughs> so, well, it's funny that, um, the people who I use the real names in the book, they loved it. Like, um, it's funny that I talk about uh, New Jersey's largest commercial beekeepers, a beekeeper, and to give an idea, like, so I have 15 hives. He runs between eight and 10,000 hives. Wow. And um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, in there, like somebody's given a presentation of all these different bee gadgets. And then he stands up and says, if I had to use all this, I'd never get any work done. And uh, he loved it. Like he's cracking up. And then um, so the, the people that I know who have read it have really enjoyed it. And then they because they can also try to figure out who the different characters are. Well, that's fun. Yeah. And I will say that um, for, for whoever asked that question, that there really is a one eyed bee guy in New Jersey. And that chapter is 100 percent true. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's worth the price of the book. <laughs> like like somebody else who read it said quote you nailed that are you yeah you nailed that one right on the head so <laughs> he's a very um compelling character in the book so <laughs> he's um uh he's a character all right that's real that's great to know that that man exists yeah, he's and he's like he's like 95 right now i mean it's mm -hmm. like it's just he just keeps going that's wonderful to hear yeah he's a hoot um uh, and we, we have one more audience question here, and then maybe uh, we can think about uh, saying goodnight soon. Um, please talk about uh, the difference between bee havers as opposed to beekeepers. Sure, and, and thank you for that question. Um, so what, just because you have bees doesn't mean you're a beekeeper. Um, oh. Like a good analogy that I use is that when somebody buys a puppy and they're like, oh, look at this cute little thing. And then it grows into a big mastiff. And then they're like, this is too much. The same is true um, with beekeeping that you have to understand that it's going to take a lot of work. I'd like to continue on the dog analogy is that like when you see a very well-behaved dog, a lot of time went into training and, and, and getting that dog to know how to behave. Sure. And the same is true with beekeeping. Like you have to spend the time to make sure that they're healthy, especially with the mites. Like one of the big jokes is that beekeepers talk more about mites than we do about bees mm -hmm. um, versus like a haver, which is like, oh, oh, I think it'd be so cool if I had a hive over in my yard. It'll look so great. So they almost think of it like a piece of outdoor furniture mm -hmm. and then they want to they <clears throat> maintain it like you would a tree, you know, like if you plant a tree, what you go and water it a couple of times a year and that's about it. Yeah. And you can't do that with honeybees. Um, so like there's a chapter in the book about uh, bee havers and some of the, some of the worst ones that I've encountered through the years. Sounds fast fascinating. Yeah. But that the one, one bee I... haver that, uh, that I call Scooby is one of my favorite characters. And again, hundred percent true. Um, <laughs> but that's like, it, it, it's funny in the book. And thankfully though, in that case with the bee haver, he realized this is beyond what he wanted to do. And so he got out, uh, pretty quickly. Okay. That's amazing. Uh, there's, um, you have a, uh, there's a, another, I don't remember the character's name in the book, but it's, um, Roots protege who gets the bee caught in <laughs> 
in his suit but he's just wearing his skivvies underneath the bee suit and so and the bees not a good idea <laughs> no <laughs> which i would never even realize but of course you would have to wear full clothes under your bee suit in case something like that happens <laughs> well i think it's more more the lesson is when you get a bee inside your veil mm -hmm. you don't open it up to yeah. let it out <laughs> so yeah, and that that was um, again, it, that was fun to write because it was. It, it, I guess like there's just the reason I think that there's so many characters in beekeeping is because you have to be sort of an individual or not not normal. Like I say, a beekeeping normal is different than other people's normal, and so that just spawns these people that are really characters. <laughs> and I put myself in that category, you know. It's um, so I, I just want to be clear, and that's why. The book also talks about my mistakes and the different things that I've done uh, through the years as well. What are some of the worst? <clears throat> what was some of the worst mistakes you made? <laughs> so that's yeah, and that's in my B mistakes. Uh, name chapter. one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I. Uh, um, it's it's. I'll tell this story because it's one of my favorite stories. That uh, so I was delivering bees and, and when you buy bees you buy them either in a package which is a you they, they're weighed out and it's three pounds of bees which is about twelve thousand, or it's what we call a nuke which is short for nucleus hive mm -hmm. and um so mm -hmm. think of a nucleus as it's it's five frames it comes in like if you know if you ever collected comic books it looks like a comic book box mm -hmm. so i was delivering those to people uh, different members that couldn't make the pickup and as I was loading them into my car, somebody was helping me and kept lifting the lids off. So in my car, I literally had a couple of thousand bees flying around in my car. <laughs> and um, the <laughs> so as I was driving, like I wasn't afraid because in, in the trick is, is bees don't like the cold. So I just pointed the air conditioning at my face and I knew the bees would stay in the back. So I'm just driving around, listening to music. Um, and I, like I talk in the book, I have a honey playlist and all these songs have to do with honey or bees. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just in my own world and I come to a stoplight and then all of a sudden I see in the rearview mirror, this guy behind me, first he almost hits me and then he jumps out of his car and starts running at my car. And he's like, bees, there's bees in your car. And then um, oh. I was wearing my club <clears throat> shirt that said bees on it. And so when he got up to the car, he's like, beekeeper <laughs> but again how many people are like okay driving around with bees in their car you know not too many i've met <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. um well we've come to about that time and i i'd like to just thank everyone out there on the web for for joining us uh and thank you for your questions uh i have linked um Frank's book here that you can pick up on our website and uh, if you don't uh, want to follow the link now just get greenapplebooks.com into your head and uh, be sure to ask for your for your wildflower seed packet when you do pick up the book and if you already have thank you very much and um, I Bob your your show is 9 a.m on Sundays is that correct? 9 a.m to uh, 10 yeah and it's a call-in show, so you can dial the number one four one five and eight zero eight five six zero zero. I answer you. a lot of questions, of course. Thank you, thank you for joining us, Bob and Frank. Thank you for joining us. It's been a real treat, and thank you for writing this book. There yeah, you go. Thank you, thank you very much for having me, because um, it's it's like I was extra excited about doing this because a good friend of mine here in New Jersey actually got interested in bees when he lived in San Francisco, oh. and he he had encountered and saw bees on the different rooftops there and he brought that excitement when he moved to jersey and now through beekeeping i have a great friend out of him so Aww. thank you for having me Tara. it's nice of isn't course. it great i like to make friends <laughs> especially through gardening and yeah well, <laughs> everything i do is gardening so that's yeah. a good, good thought yeah always oh Thanks thank you me, of way. course thank you so much for joining us thank you both you're welcome take Enjoy. care everybody bye-bye have a good night take care <clears throat> Enjoy it all. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>